Let's turn to John chapter 6 tonight, please. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 6. Have you ever experienced a miracle? We just sang a song. It took a miracle. Have you ever experienced a miracle? <laughs> yeah. If you're a believer, that's a miracle. You're, you're saved. That is only something that God can do. It's not something that we can do for ourselves. You know, miracles, uh, in one sense, however, I guess you would say are, are less common uh, as far as the kind of activity that God exerts in this world. Uh, but when he does, he uses miracles to both arouse awe and amazement in people and, of course, to bring witness to himself, to who he is and to what he can do. You need a miracle? Maybe you need a miracle in your finances. Or maybe you need a miracle in your family. Or maybe you're facing some danger that you feel you need a miracle at this point. Or perhaps some type of healing. It could be mental, it could be emotional, or a physical healing. And you feel you need a miracle. Well, let me say this. God is always working in unique ways, including miraculous ways. God works providentially in our circumstances. You remember Paul being shipwrecked in Acts chapter 27? And how that all worked out? Well, God was at work in that shipwreck. He was at work in what we would say a providential way. But in the next chapter, when they get to shore, and Paul gets bit by that poisonous snake, and he just shakes it off, and there's no after effect whatsoever. That's a miracle. And then, as a result of that miracle, it gets the attention of the ruler of that island, and he believes. And also, I think, if I remember the passage correctly, his father is healed miraculously uh, by the Apostle Paul. And so God mixes it up. He works providentially, but at times he works miraculously. I've heard testimony of someone who was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And before that person was able to have surgery, they looked at the scan again and they found that the tumor was gone. And it was the result of the church that was praying for this uh, brother. Well, I am sure that that church prayed for other people that were uh, ill in their congregation, and God didn't do it. You can find that again in the scripture. In Acts chapter 12, it's very interesting to me, that the church is praying, Peter's in prison, the church is praying, and as a result, in answer to their prayer, there's an earthquake, and uh, Peter is, uh, actually, an angel comes. I'm thinking of uh, Paul in Philippi. In Acts 12, an angel comes at night, wakes Peter up, tells Peter to get his coat, and uh, follow me. And he walks him right out of the prison and uh, right out of the gate. That was a miracle. That same church had prayed for James, the apostle, but he didn't get delivered that way. He got his head chopped off. See, God works deliverance in different ways, different ways than we think. But in the New Testament, I think the record shows that uh, uh, miracles, God's supernatural guidance, uh, were, were somewhat common, both in personal lives as well as in the life of the church as a whole. So again, you think you need a miracle? The passage that I've had you turn to tonight, John chapter 6, records the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. By the way, that's the only miracle, other than the resurrection, of course, that is included in all four of the Gospels. It's significant. 
the feeding of the 5,000, which really, if you think what Matthew says, Matthew says that there were 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And so that crowd could have been at least double that. Could have been 10,000, could have been as much as 20,000 people. It was a huge uh, crowd that uh, were fed. So we have here a miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. And I want to share with you tonight three truths that emerge about miracles out of this passage after we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be together tonight and thank you for your word, the Bible. We pray that it would have exactly the impact and the effect that you desire. Teach us tonight, Holy Spirit. We need your unction. We need your anointing. And we accept it both as the messenger and as the hearers. We accept your unction tonight and give you thanks for what you're going to do. Lift up Jesus, our Savior, we pray in his name. Amen. And one of the first things I want to point out to you, if you would look with me at this passage, it says in uh, verse 2, a great multitude followed him, him being Jesus, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Now, which leads me to say this. You think you need a miracle? Why? Why do you want a miracle? These people were following Jesus simply because they wanted a miracle. In chapter 5, the chapter before this, Jesus heals a man that has been lame for 38 years, and he is beside that pool of Bethesda, waiting, remember, for the stirring of the waters. And uh, he never gets there first. And so Jesus comes by and heals him. But before he heals him, you know what Jesus says to him? You want to be healed? You know, it, it's another way of saying, you want a miracle? Because for this man to be healed, after being crippled for 38 years, it's going to require a miracle. So Jesus asks him, do you want a miracle? Inherent in that question, it goes to the heart, really, of a desire for a miracle. First of all, the sincerity of it and the ambition that's connected with it, or the motive. Why do you want a miracle? Is basically what he's saying. You think you need a miracle? Do you really need a miracle? Is there any other possible way that your situation can be worked out? Look here in John chapter 6. It says uh, in the, uh, in the uh, verses that follow that they, Jesus, he sees in verse 5 the multitude, and he says, where are we going to get bread that these may eat? And uh, Philip answers in verse 7, he said, well, you know, <laughs> 200 penny worth. Well, you know how much that is? That's about eight, mo eight months wages wouldn't be enough to buy food or bread for a crowd this size. In other words, <laughs> it's an impossibility. We don't have the resources. We don't have the money. Even if we could get to, the, to, to a place where we could purchase that much, we don't have the money. And then uh, Philip comes along, uh, or, or uh, rather Andrew comes along a little later, and he says in verse 9, hey, there's a little boy here that has a couple loaves of bread and fish, but, you know, <laughs> I know that's ridiculous. What is that among so many? These people are following Jesus. This great multitude of thousands of people are following him because they want a miracle. But why do they want a miracle? Well, when you look down at uh, verses 14 and 15, uh, when they seen the miracle that Jesus did, it says, they said, this, this has to be that prophet 
that was promised to us that is coming to the world. And when Jesus perceived that they were going to come and take him by force and make him their king. Why? Because, hey, this was their supply source. He was going to do miracles for the... You want a miracle? You need a miracle? Why? Why do you want a miracle? The sincerity of it here. Do you really need a miracle? Is there any other possible way? Uh, are your personal resources or other resources exhausted that you need a miracle? Are you sure that you're desiring a miracle for God's will or for yours? The sincerity of it. Why do you want a miracle? And then the ambition that goes along with wanting a miracle. Why do you want a miracle? Because you're looking for a quick fix? Do you want a miracle because you know if you have a miracle, it'll give you a great feeling of security? That everything's going to be okay? You want a miracle so that you or others can feel good? Or do you want a miracle for the glory of God? Now be honest. What's the real purpose in your life? In other words, why do you want a miracle? Who are you living for anyway? Are you living for yourself or are you living for the Lord? That's the first question. And that's the first truth that emerges out of John 6, the feeding of the 5,000. You need a miracle? Why do you want it? And the second question that uh, brings forth the truth that I want to share with you tonight is found in verse 9. Andrew says, there's a uh, little boy here. There's a boy here. He has uh, five barley loaves and two small fish. Pretty measly when we're talking about thousands and thousands of people. And he knows it because he says, but, you know, what's that among so many? There is a lad here which has, doesn't have a whole lot. He has something. Five barley loaves and two fish. By the way, barley was poor man's food. And fish, they weren't lake trout. They were probably little sardines like you get in a can. <laughs> Well, they didn't come in cans, but they were small. Two small fish, five little poor man bread, basically what he had to offer. Second question and truth that emerges, you need a miracle? Not only what do you want, but what will you give? Oh, I thought Miracles was all about God giving, not me giving. Well, miracles may not involve a human being at all times, but I'm telling you, often miracles are going to cost you. There's a cost attached to it. Miracles may involve a personal cost. In other words, we're talking about sacrifice. Even though human beings aren't always necessary in every miracle you're, you find in the Bible, but at times, miracles that are desired require personal sacrifice on your part. Like here, this little boy, it wasn't much, but it was enough for him, but he had to give the whole thing up, right? Remember the prophet Elijah? When the Lord, uh, when he announced there was going to be three and a half years of drought, and he uh, was led by the Lord to go to uh, Sidon, and there a widow would meet him, and he saw this widow, she was gathering sticks, and uh, he said, hey, uh, go fix me uh, a little bread. And she confessed to him, she said, well, actually, I'm gathering these sticks because I'm going to make a fire, and I'm going to take the last bit of flour that I have, and I'm going to make a little bread for my son and I, and that, then we're going to starve to death. I don't have any more. That's it. He said, you do what I say. Basically, God will take care of you. And you know what happened, right? She did. She gave everything up 
made him first what he needed. And guess what? God performed a miracle. The meal that she used to make him a, a cake or bread, it, it, uh, it didn't disappear. It was a miracle. But it, re it required her giving all that she had first. You want a miracle? You need a miracle? What will you give? What are you willing to sacrifice? In both of these cases, the little boy or the widow, it, it required a full and total sacrifice of all of their provision. And that was the foundation for the miracle. That was it. You see, if you need a miracle, it's going to require your participation. You're going to have to make a personal choice to be willing to totally surrender to God's guidance and to totally cooperate with him in some way that may require personal sacrifice on your part. Maybe it's a sacrifice of your time. Maybe it's a sacrifice of your effort. Maybe it's a sacrifice of your money or material things. You want to see a miracle, a, a, a miraculous breakthrough in a person's life? Well, it may require that you sacrifice some meals and some sleep and uh, that you take the initiative to pray, to intercede on the behalf of that individual or that you meet someone's needs. Maybe it would require you to take the initiative to make a tough decision to stop enabling a loved one. Or maybe it will require you to make a decision that you're going to have to make a difficult phone call or maybe even a personal visit to someone. You need a miracle? See, God doesn't just solve our problems. He makes us part of it, part of the solution. And so, what do you want? And then also, this second question... What will you give? And then the third thing that I want to share with you tonight, as far as the truth that emerges out of this thought, I need a miracle, is what do you believe? What do you believe? Look at uh, John 6 again and go down to verse 11. Here, Jesus takes the loaves, <laughs> five little barley loaves, two little fish, sardines, he took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to the disciples, and then the disciples to them that were, that were set down, and likewise the fish, as much as they would. What do you see here? I see the Lord thanking the Heavenly Father, his Heavenly Father, prior to the miracle. Some people aren't looking for a miracle. They're, and they're not looking for a miracle simply because they don't believe a miracle is possible, that God doesn't do them. <laughs> but if you perceive that you have a need for a miracle, like these people did, like these disciples did, then what you have here is God is going to use this to challenge your faith in a couple of areas. In fact, that's exactly what his plan was. Look, he deliberately brings up the question in verse 5. Where are we going to find uh, uh, enough bread to buy for these people? But verse 6 gives us a little clue as to what's going on in Jesus' thinking. And this he said to prove him, to prove uh, uh, Philip. This he said to prove him for he, Jesus, knew what he would do. He knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to miraculously provide for these thousands and thousands of people. God puts us in these situations where we think we need a miracle because he wants to really test what you believe. What do you believe? Do you believe do you, he wants to challenge your faith in two areas. Number one, your confidence. 
Jesus thanks the Father before the miracle of that multiplication of that little boy's lunch. How confident are you that God has miraculous power to work in your situation? How confident are you in that, of that? Needs to take some personal inventory and you need to honestly determine what you're really depending upon in your life. Are you depending upon the money that you have or that you can get if you need it? On that job that will bring in whatever you need or that check that comes every month? What are you really dependent upon? You got to be honest here. Who or what are you trusting in? What do you believe? He thanked his heavenly father before the miracle happened. He knew what he would do. He knew that the miracle would take place. Confident. He had confidence. There's a second area. Not only is this a test in the area of our confidence, it's a challenge also to us being convinced. I think that unbelief is what prevents us from experiencing any miracles in our life. Unbelief. It's a killer as far as miracles are concerned. And I think that God desires to bring us to the place in which all of our doubt about him vanishes completely. That we become totally convinced not only that God is able to do a miracle, but he will do a miracle. You need a miracle? Perhaps tonight you're here or you're watching and you're lost in sin. You need a miracle. And I'm thankful that God's able. He's able to perform that kind of a miracle. Maybe tonight you're confused or you're upset over your circumstances and you, you need a miracle. Well, that miracle is the voice of the Lord saying, Peace, be still to your troubled soul. But you'll only find that as you open up God's word and he'll speak to your heart and he'll make sure it's well with your soul. If your soul feels numb and spiritually dry, you need a miracle. You need perhaps a spiritual visitation. You need a supernatural spiritual touch from God himself to revive your heart and to restore your soul. Well, open up your Bible and you'll find in it a spiritual miracle. You'll find that he will open up springs of living water to your thirsty soul. But going back to the point that if you are not saved, you need that miracle of salvation in your life. And the Bible promises that you can be born anew. It's a miraculous new birth. And Jesus says it's the necessity in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says, it's not by being born of man, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of blood, but of God. It's a miraculous birth. And if that's what you need tonight, God will do it. Many years ago in Moscow, there was a, an actor in a theater who was converted while he was playing the role of, uh, of Jesus in a sacrilegious play called Christ in a Tuxedo. He was supposed to read two verses from the Sermon on the Mount, remove his gown, and cry out, give me my tuxedo and top hat. But as he read those words, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. He began to tremble. And instead of following the script, he kept reading from Matthew 5, ignoring the coughs and the, and the calls and the foot stomping of his fellow actors backstage. And finally, recalling a verse that he had learned in his childhood in a Russian Orthodox church of all places, he remembered the verse, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And before that curtain could be lowered, this man had trusted Christ as his personal savior. That's miraculous. Your salvation may not have been as dramatic as that, but it's just as miraculous as that. Because salvation is something, as I began saying, that only God can do for you and in you. It's not something that you can do for yourself. You simply cooperate by receiving the free gift that he offers to you. And so tonight, I want to ask you again, you need a miracle? What do you want? Why do you want what you want? What are you willing to give? And what do you believe when it comes to this? What do you believe? What confidence do you have? How much are you convinced regarding God's will and God's work? Let's pause a moment for prayer. Heavenly Father, just ask that you'll at least use this to cause us to think and to really consider this thing of a miracle. We thank you that you are the Almighty. You are a miracle-working God. But Lord, may we want you and your powerful work for the right reasons, for your glory, and for nothing else. Not for a better situation, not for self-aggrandizement because we were able to get a miracle from God or whatever. And Lord, if there be anyone that has never experienced the miracle of the new birth, may this be the, the time in which they would trust you as their personal Savior and pass from spiritual and eternal death to life eternal, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.